Tonight on College Press Box, there's a new head football coach at Texas. Hear from him and our analysts about the future of Texas football. Plus, we tie a bow on the Charlie Strong era. A look back at one of the most beloved but criticized coaches on the 40 acres. And we review a wild year around college football. College Press Box starts right now. We hope you had a happy Thanksgiving break and welcome back to College Press Box. I'm Katarina Biancardi. And I'm Reese Miller. Well, what a difference a week makes around here. Charlie Strong is out. Tom Herman is in as the 30th head coach at the University of Texas. And definitely a wild week, Reese. One coach fired and another hired in a matter of a day. But the future is looking bright. Yeah, no doubt about that. But before we get too far into the Longhorns future, let's take a look back and really show you how it all played out after rumors surfaced Sunday night that Charlie Strong was fired by Texas. Strong and Athletic Director Mike Parent said a decision would be made after the TCU game. So one last chance for Strong to prove he deserved another year. Senior day, don't forget about that as well. Final go round for Paul Boyette, Tyrone Swoops, Dylan Haynes, and many other seniors taking on TCU, the only Big 12 team that Charlie Strong has yet to beat so far. But in the first quarter, first drive for TCU, Kenny Trill makes it look easy, scrambles in for a four yard score, seven nothing, Frogs. Next drive, Bouchelle, the deep balls back to Devin Duvernay, 48 yards, that sets up Texas inside the red zone, they convert on a field goal, 7-3 later. Texas trying to take a lead, but a fourth down stop. Deonta Foreman did not get across the goal line, even though it looked very close on the replay. So TCU driving out of their in own end zone, basically. Kenny Hill, not really sure where that one was going. Deshaun Elliott picks it off and returns it down. He was injured for a little bit, but uh, that will certainly help the pain turnover. And Texas is rolling once again. They would convert a field goal from that drive. Later, it's 10-9 now, and Kenny Hill takes off third quarter, and Dylan Haynes won't want to put that on his senior scrapbook. Hill trots in his second rushing touchdown of the day. It's 17-9, Horn Frogs. Texas trying to still hang around. Foster Sawyer in at QB, and Travoris Johnson rolls in at running back. TCU takes a 24-9 lead and wins it 31-9 in what would turn out to be the final game of Charlie Strong's career. And although the loss to TCU sealed Strong's fate, there's still something positive to take away from the blowout. Tyler King wraps up the final game for the Texas seniors and tells us how a Heisman contender joined a league company. The Texas senior class took the field at DKR for the last time on Saturday. For seniors Dylan Haynes and Tim Cole, even though the results weren't what they envisioned on the season, they enjoyed their time on the 40 acres. It's been a really emotional journey, and it's been a long journey for me. Being, um, you know, being this being my fifth year, I'm just grateful and thankful that that I had five years, um, you know, with Coach Brown for two, and then three with Coach Strong. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I mean, I know the season has, you know, didn't go out how I planned it, but you know, for the most part, I enjoyed it. Just you know, coming back, just teaching these young guys, you know, any knowledge I had for the, you know, for the game. With his 165-yard performance on the ground against TCU. Running back Deontay Foreman became the second Longhorn alongside Ricky Williams to rush for 2,000 yards in a single season. You know, he's an outstanding player, and, and for him to get to 2,000 yards, I'm so happy for him. And, and, you know, and it hurts him more than anyone because how bad he wanted to win that football game. And, and he doesn't ever just look at just, you know, the, the records for himself. He is, no, it's a team effort. While being mentioned in the realm of Texas legends Ricky Williams and Earl Campbell, Farman was speechless on being in the same class as them. I can't even put into words what it means, man. I'm, I'm so proud, you know. Um, the season didn't go the way we wanted it to go, but, you know, I, I've been blessed, you know, to be able to be up there and, and to be mentioned with those guys. So, you know, I, I, I'll never, you know, deny that, that how happy I am about that. With his stellar performance on the season, Foreman believes he should be in New York City for the Heisman Award ceremony. 
Tyler King, College Press Box. We welcome in the studio tonight Tyler King and Luke Henry. Guys, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having us. Now, although Charlie Strong's records, record 16 and 21 did not meet expectations, he believes in the goals and what he leaves behind. You know, when I took this job uh, three years ago, you know, I, I uh, came here and I, for one reason. I came here to win a, uh, for a number of reasons. I came here to win a national championship and I came here to change lives. And when I took the job, I just felt like that I knew that I would impact the players that are inside that locker room and the players that have been through that locker room. I knew I would do that. And, but it was just more than just that. Our the record doesn't speak for j how good we are, but the thing is, this is a team that has a chance to, to go and go win them a, a national championship because the, the lessons that they learned this year, the adversity that they had to overcome this year, then it's, it's going to be taught for them. Guys, plenty of questions for both of you, Luke and Tyler, regarding Tom Herman and the Texas future. But quickly, let's go ahead and address what Charlie Strong leaves behind. Really a critical hire from the beginning, turned into one of the most beloved coaches by the players and the fans in all of college football, from the five core values to the rules he set. There's really no questioning the impact he left on the lives of the Longhorns. In the end, he couldn't overcome a 16-21 and 21 record, and the memorable upset wins weren't enough to cover up. Really, the inexcusable losses, guys, but uh, Charlie Strong certainly leaves a lot of young talent here on campus, but what do you think is really the legacy Coach Strong leaves behind? I think the legacy uh, of Charlie Strong is certainly growing young men, as you mentioned, Reese. His program was built on core values, and that style of leading a college football program has defined Coach Strong's coaching career all over. It has been clear how Strong's players feel about him and his ability to build quality relationships with his team. The wins and losses certainly did not stack up this last three years for Charlie Strong and his program at the 40 Acres, but he did shape the lives of many young men. Strong's legacy will be taking young student athletes and creating men of character. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Strong ran a very clean, tight ship. And if this team goes on to win in the next couple of years, Strong needs to be credited with laying that foundation bringing in a lot of young talent. I mean, Sterling Gilbert said they, they returned 37 of the 44 on the two deep. There's no excuses to not win, to not have a chance to win the next couple of years with all that depth. So Charlie needs to be credited with having, laying, having laid the foundation for Tom Herman to succeed. Absolutely, guys. He certainly did leave that foundation. Now, Strong was officially let go Saturday morning, and Texas wasted no time finding their next head coach, Tom Herman. The school announced Saturday evening the former Longhorn would be the 30th head coach. Herman's coaching career began as a graduate assistant actually at Texas Reese under Mac Brown. Yeah, actually in the late 90s after a few other stops in the Lone Star State. Rice, you had Texas State in there, Sam Houston State. Herman eventually was the offensive coordinator for Iowa State, vaulted later to Columbus as the OC under Urban Meyer, helping the Buckeyes to a national championship in the first year of the college football playoff with their third string. QB at the time, Cardell Jones, of course, despite having only two years of head coaching experience at Houston, he led the Cougs to a 22-4 and record and was 6-0 against ranked opponents. Needless to say, he has quite an impressive resume. And on Sunday, Texas welcomed Tom Herman back to the 40 Acres. But now we are home, and I can't wait to get started. The University of Texas is a place, a special place, and deservedly holds a seat among college football elite. We will win championships, we will build men of character, we will graduate our players, and we will do it all with integrity and with class. So Reese, there is many unanswered questions. Does Herman keep any of strong staff? Uh, if Texas receives a bid to a bowl, will Herman accept? So as Texas football transitions into a new era under Herman, what do you expect to happen in the next month? Yeah, I think there's a lot of questions to be addressed. His coaching staff, mm -hmm. if Texas gets uh, that bowl bid, do they accept? Uh, but I think the main thing is the staff he's going to assemble with a lot of Houston guys, presumably so far, and really what kind of recruiting class can he get going. But Tyler and Luke, I want to get your opinion on this as well. What are really the next steps for Coach Herman? Well, I mean, I think a lot of people are you know, mentioning Texas has a chance to get a bowl invitation. 
I'm kind of torn. You know, the bowl invitation, uh, if they get a bowl, it'd be during the dead period of recruiting, so it wouldn't affect recruiting too much. Herman gets an extra 15 practices and a game to, sh to see what he has uh, for next season, you know, before spring practice even rolls around. Uh, Deontay Foreman also has a chance to break Ricky's, Ricky Williams' uh, single season uh, rushing record. Deontay only needs about 96 yards to go, so I think it could be beneficial, but I also think for Herman, I think the right decision is just get your coaching staff together and focus on what you need to do in recruiting to get the best recruiting class possible. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that coaching staff, Tyler, and as of earlier today, Coach Herman met with each assistant currently on the 40 acres who have been under Coach Strong, and not a single one of them will be returning next season. According to reports, Coach Herman will not keep any of Coach Strong's assistants, and his search for a coaching staff will begin as soon as he gets going at, at the 40 acres, which is right now. Coaches at Houston have indicated they will come to Texas and join Herman here on the 40 acres. But as far as a defensive and offensive coordinator, those spots are currently open, big spots to fill for the Texas football program. But Tom Herman needs to get with his staff and start working hard over the next couple months and just build a solid coalition to go into the off season. Yeah, and also it's been mentioned that at Herman's initial team meeting with the, uh, with the meeting with the team, uh, cornerback coach Jason Washington from U of H, O-line coach Derek Wareheim, and DN's coach Oscar Giles were present in the meeting. So it looks like at least three coaches from U of H will be coming with Herman. Good chance there's more to come. Yeah, guys, I know I was personally a little bit surprised. No Jeff Trailer, uh, no Brian G. Mary, two of the best recruiters on this current staff. Guys, there's no, qu there's no questioning the pressure at this job here at Texas, the national championship status, People demand, but so far, Tom Herman not phased by that pressure. I think pressure is that uneasy feeling that you feel when you're unprepared. Um, pressure is self-inflicted. Pressure is, um, you know, self-doubt when you're you're unprepared. We're we're prepared for this job. We're prepared for uh, success at this job. We're prepared for adversity in this job, and so. I don't, I don't feel any sense of pressure uh, at all. Okay, guys, Texas opens the 2017 campaign against Maryland, faces San Jose and USC in non-conference play. But before next season can begin, there's plenty of work in the offseason being done. How do you foresee Herman tackling his new Texas team? Okay, Coach Herman certainly has his own agenda for accomplishing what he wants over his first offseason here but one of the things that stands out is the quarterback position. Shane Bouchelle is coming off his freshman season. Four-star recruit Sam Ellinger will enroll in January. And rumors circulate the fact that Kyle Allen may or may not be transferring to Houston following Coach Herman. So all of those things loom over the quarterback position at Texas. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is getting the right guys on the staff be able to implement the system he wants on both sides of the ball because the biggest flaw that Charlie had was getting that offensive system going and not having the right coaches that work together. That's the other thing, making sure you have plenty of coaches that work together and understand how to work around each other. Talking about quarterback, though, if they don't bring in Kyle Allen, I still think they, get, they have a chance to bring another quarterback. Watch out for Bryson Smith from John Tyler, currently committed to Houston, a lot like Greg Ward, so fits that offense pretty well. Absolutely, guys. There is a lot of unanswered questions, and it's pretty exciting to see how it will all unfold. And you know, a new era at Texas always brings tons of hype, and everybody's going to be on this Tom Herman train. What do you think, Reese? Yeah, I think so. It's definitely a, a bright future ahead. I think we can all agree on that. Certainly a crazy uh, last couple of weeks. Guys, thanks so much again. And uh, coming up, we take a look at the college football season outside of the 40 acres. Don't go anywhere. Hi, welcome back to College Press Box's College Football Special. I'm Steve Helwick here with Mackenzie Palmer. The Big 12 and Group of Five have been intriguing all season. Let's start with a rundown of the Big 12. The Big 12 was a conference of consistency this year and will likely result in no playoff team in 2016. Oklahoma looks to be the front runner with an undefeated Big 12 record 
with Oklahoma State and West Virginia trailing behind, but the conference was chaotic with upsets such as Central Michigan over Oklahoma State and Kansas over Texas. Bedlam is the unofficial Big 12 championship game right here. The two standout teams are Oklahoma and their in-state rival, Oklahoma State. The Sooners have won eight straight, and the Cowboys have won seven straight, heading into this unofficial Big 12 championship in Norman this Saturday. Both teams have two losses, but only one combined Big 12 loss. Oklahoma fell to Houston and Ohio State, while the Pokes dropped games to the Chippewas and Baylor Bears. This championship has a very intriguing quarterback matchup with two of the best quarterbacks in the nation, the Gunslingers, Baker Mayfield, Mason Rudolph. We should have a good one. They have great offensive receivers, weapons, D.D. Westbrook for Oklahoma, James Washington for the Oklahoma State, and it results in a Sugar Bowl appearance they're fighting for, superiority and a rivalry, and bragging rights for an entire conference. So let's look at the MVPs of the conference. I just mentioned Baker Mayfield is probably the offensive MVP despite Pat Mahomes' fantastic stats he put together this season. Mayfield leads the nation in quarterback rating by a mile. He's been important all season in resurrecting Oklahoma from that 1-2 and two start. And when the defense was allowing 46, 59 points a season, it was Mayfield that kept the Sooners in control and preserved their undefeated conference record. He finished fourth last year in the Heisman race and will probably receive some votes this year. Exactly. Trayvon Howard of TCU looks to be the defensive MVP. The star inside linebacker was crucial in stopping the run and demonstrated, demonstrated great coverage ability. He led the Big 12 with 119 tackles and should be recognized as the conference MVP. So next season, I see the Big 12 unfolding very similarly to this season. Oklahoma has been steady front runners for years and years in this Bob Stoops era. And if they win on Saturday, they could go for a three-peat in the conference title in 2017. In terms of who can challenge the Sooners, I see TCU rising. They're 6-5 and five this season. But Gary Patterson always comes back from these bad seasons. He's done a great job making the most of those players that he has in Fort Worth. Exactly. I completely agree, Steve. Oklahoma has held the lead consecutive over the last few years and I believe that TCU can climb the ladder back somewhere near the top but I also see a rise in Longhorn football with Herman Leaney leading a winning season for 2017 something that the fans hoped Charlie Strong would do in 2014. It's been an interesting season in the group of five Houston beat Oklahoma week one and looked destined to be a top team but upsets happened despite the only team to beat two of the top five teams Three conference losses prevent the Cougs from appearing in the conference championship. Uh, Houston's playing in that American conference. It's such a stacked, strong conference. South Florida and Navy are ranked right now. Houston just looking on the outside. Memphis, Tulsa, Temple, they all have eight or nine wins. And with the American might even be better and top heavy than the Big 12 this season. They've, they've looked fantastic all year. And... But the standout team in college football in the group of five is not in the American, but the MAC. The Mid-American Conference has Western Michigan, one of two undefeated teams in the nation. And they are just simply not getting respect from the committee. The exactly. committee put them at 21 this week. They have a conference championship game against Ohio. But P.J. Fleck has led this program from 1-11 to undefeated in a matter of three seasons. They've scored four, they've won each game since Northwestern by over 14 points, and they've beaten two Big Ten teams on the road. Clearly a phenomenal team this season, inspiring his players each win, never overlooking an opponent. P.J. Fleck has got to be coach of the year, and it could be the first group of five team to go undefeated since 2002 TCU. Exactly. 2010 TCU. Navy Temple winner, only other Cotton Bowl contender. Quarterback Will Worth leads FBS in rushing touchdowns and is favored to beat the Owls on Saturday. Navy scored 75 last week and its triple option looks unstoppable lately, but Temple is 9-3 with six straight wins. It could find a way into the Cotton Bowl with MWU and Navy falling this weekend. So, MVPs of the conference, I'm going to keep rowing the boat with Western Michigan. I'm going with the Zach Terrell and Corey Davis co-MVPs. That connection has been deadly all year. Terrell, the quarterback. Corey Davis is now college football's all-time leading receiver, shattering a record that has lasted since 1999. He did that on Friday. Davis 
uh, has over 5,000 career receiving yards. Great combination of speed and strength that will definitely translate to the next level in NFL. He's been vital to WMU success and undefeated record. And Terrell is the most accurate quarterback in the nation. He's thrown 30 touchdowns, only one interception this year. Leads a team with the fewest turnovers in the FBS. The connection's unstoppable, and we'll be blessed to see these two seniors play two more times in the MAC championship game against Ohio and potentially the Cotton Bowl if they win that game. Exactly. San Diego State's Donnell Umphrey should also be under consideration. The halfback who was exhibited blazing speed each game is 217 yards away from breaking Ron Dane's record to become NCAA's all-time leading rusher. Yeah, Pumphrey's had a very good season, but the Aztecs have fallen off lately. On the defensive side, I really like freshman defensive tackle Ed Oliver, that five-star recruit from Houston. He dominated week one against Oklahoma, and he looked great. He, he closed the gap on Lamar Jackson's Heisman race when Houston beat Louisville 36-10. to Oliver's been stellar all year, and I think he has been the group of five's top defensive player. He should just continue to do this for his next couple years in college. Uh, the American has a lot of returning juggernauts for next year. Uh, Houston, without Tom Herman, they, they've been recruiting very well recently. I mentioned Oliver, the five-star recruit, and they also have a former number one quarterback recruit in the nation in Kyle Allen, who might lead the Cougs next year. But I think the best group of five team will be in Tampa, and that is the South Florida Bulls. Willie Taggart's done a phenomenal job coaching there. They will have an explosive offense uh, led by Quinton Flowers, a quarterback, Marlon Mack at running back. I think the South Florida Bulls could run the table, maybe one loss, and appear in one of those New Year Six Bulls next year. What do you think? Awesome. Memphis and UFC have strong offenses, and I'd be interested to see if they can capitalize on their surprising successes in 2016. For other conferences, Toledo and Boise State should emerge as strong contenders along with the stacked American Conference, but with the American Conference, the sixth power conference, Firepower, it may be harder for Toledo and Boise State to get to the New Year's six slots. Definitely, I agree with all of that there. We'll get ready to watch Bedlam on Saturday morning on Fox, and four Group of Five championship games are this weekend. Sugar Bowl and Cotton Bowl appearances all at stake in the Big 12 and Group of Five, so it should definitely be a good one. Awesome. After the break, we'll have more on the Pac-12 and ACC talk with Jordan Strickland and Nick Kuholtz. Stay tuned. Welcome back to College Press Box. I'm Jordan Strickland. And I'm Nick Kuholtz. Jordan, many conferences have championship games this weekend with playoff implications on the line, and one of those is the Pac-12. Yes, coming into the season, many people expected running back Christian McCaffrey and the Stanford Cardinals to make a run for the Pac-12 championship and the football playoffs. But in the end, Cardinals' injuries and halted running game prevented their run to the playoffs and opened the door for the Washington Huskies to crawl in. With a win, the Huskies could almost guarantee themselves a spot in the playoffs as long as they don't suffer the same, lo same luck that TCU suffered back in 2014. However, their opponent, the Colorado Buffaloes, are aiming to capture the Pac-12 title and a ticket to Pasadena for the Rose Bowl. <clears throat> Coming in, or excuse me, while the Washington Huskies are currently ranked fifth in the nation, the, one of the best teams. In, oh, excuse me, <laughs> while the Washington Huskies are currently ranked fifth in the nation, the one team that has caught the entire country's eye has been the number nine, Colorado Buffaloes, led by head coach Mike McIntyre. This is a team that finished four and nine last year, only winning nine, or only winning one of nine conference games. Its only losses that year, this year, have come to the hands of the Michigan Wolverines and the number twelve ranked. USC Trojans. Senior leader Seth Falufa has thrown for 2,100 yards with 11 touchdowns, while running back Philip Lindsay has surpassed the 1,000-yard mark, and the Buffalo's receivers Shea Fields, Bryce Bobble, and Devin Ross have each received over 500 yards through the air. On the other side of the ball, there's experienced, def experienced defensive starters, with Tedrick Thompson as safety and cornerback Akela Witherspoon leading the entire nation, both with 21 passes defended. Senior captain Chidobia Wuzie leads the team in tackles. This is an experienced team that has a chance to capture their first conference title this Friday and is turning heads around the nation. As for MVPs, you look no further than Dory Jackson of the USC Trojans. While some overlook him because of his size, this is a versatile defensive back who has scored in every unit, including a touchdown at wideout with two touchdowns apiece from punt returns and kickoff returns. 
as a corner, he's earned the spot as a Jim Thorpe Award finalist with a recorded 56 total tackles and 14 passes defended, including two key interceptions in the Trojans' upset against the Washington Huskies and standout QB Jake Browning. He's the closest thing to Jabril Peppers that the Pac-12 Conference has, and if Jabril Peppers wins the Heisman, Adoree Jackson definitely deserves the crown of the Pac-12. The future of the Pac-12 could be unfolding right in front of our eyes. I believe this is the beginning of an era for the Washington Huskies. Star QB Jake Browning will be entering his junior year next season and may and may predict the potential and many predict the potential wide receiver John Ross is a definite draft pick in this year's draft, but Dante Pettis is ready to step into his shoes. On defense, the Huskies are returning nine players as long as Buda Baker decides to play his final year. With Oregon in a period of uncertainty, the Pac-12 North rests in the hands of the Huskies. As for the South Division, current champs, the Colorado Buffaloes, will lose eight defensive starters and senior QB Sefa Lufau, among others. While this has been a great year for them, the younger USC Trojans are, are on a roll right now, and even with, the losing, even with losing a Dory Jackson and senior receiver Juju Smith-Schuster to the draft, they still have potential to return 16 starters and have Pac-12 South in the palm of their hand. Also, don't write off the Utah Utes, who feel that their season was halted and stolen from them by a last-second score from Oregon. Expect them to come back with a chip on their shoulder. Moving from far out west, we go to the other side of the country to the Atlantic Coast Conference. Last season, head coach Dabo Sweeney and the Clemson Tigers won the ACC championship, went to the college football playoff before eventually falling to the Alabama Crimson Tide in the national championship game. But could the Tigers have the same success this year? You bet they could. Led by junior quarterback Dabo Sweeney, or pardon me, Deshaun Watson, Clemson would finish 11-1 on the season, winning the Atlantic side of the conference. This Saturday, the Tigers will meet the Virginia Tech Hokies, winners of the Coastal side in Orlando, Florida at 7 o'clock in the ACC Championship game. Jordan, with the committee, obviously, there's no sure thing, but you would think that if Clemson were to go on and win the ACC Championship, they should get one of those four spots in the college football playoff. I couldn't agree more. You know, you look at a team like Clemson, this is a one-loss team, a team that's overcome a lot of obstacles, and they just embarrass teams like Florida State, teams like Duke, teams like North Carolina. This is a very powerful team. They deserve a spot in the playoffs, and I'd like to see them in the end in the showdown with Alabama or Ohio State. Yeah, if they, do, if they win and don't get in, I'd be very surprised. But while the Clemson Tigers were the top team in the conference, one individual in the ACC this season took the college football world by storm. Lamar Jackson, sophomore quarterback of the Louisville Cardinals, put up video game numbers in his second collegiate year, finishing with 4,928 total yards, over 1,500 of those coming on the ground, and recorded 51 total touchdowns. Now, the Cardinals lost their last two games of the year, which will definitely hurt Jackson's shot at the Heisman, but the 19-year-old will nonetheless be invited to New York and could still possibly bring the trophy to Louisville for the first time in school history. As for next season, Deshaun Watson leaving for the NFL Draft will definitely hurt the Clemson Tigers' chance to remain as the lone powerhouse in the conference, but every year they prove to be competitive. Also, look out for the Florida State Seminoles to get back to the top where they're used to being, and the North Carolina Tar Heels will be a threat in the coastal side of the conference. And, of course, Lamar Jackson returning for his third year at Louisville will be thrilling to watch. While the ACC was action-packed all season long, a different Power 5 conference has a chance of sending two of their teams to the college football playoff. After the break, Jonathan Pulasic and Eric Goodman will bring you more on the Big Ten. Stay with us. with us it's now time to take a look at the undisputed premier conference in college football this season the big 10 the monsters of the midwest i'm eric goodman here with jonathan Pulasic, and we're going to start with the most anticipated matchup of the college football season number two ohio state versus number three michigan in columbus this past saturday the game that's game with the capital g lived up to the hype and then some the two quarterbacks wilton spate for michigan and jt barrett for ohio state they struggled mightily for all 60 minutes of regulation, but a last-second field goal for the Buckeyes sent this one into overtime, and that's where we'll pick it up from the horseshoe. Urban Meyer and Jim Harbaugh, two of the most polarizing coaches in college football. JT Barrett, it wasn't easy for him on the day, but that sure is. That is a touchdown on Ohio State's first overtime possession, putting the pressure on Michigan. Wilton Spate, three turnovers, also played poorly in regulation, but that is a dime to Amara Darbo, tying the game. Michigan gets the ball back, and they're held to just a field goal, meaning the game is in the hands of Barrett. 
he hands to Curtis Samuel. No, and it's uh, short. You, you be the judge of whether or not he, he got this uh, first down on a fourth and one. A lot of controversy here. They give it to him. And that brings up Curtis Samuel for his 15-yard run untouched. That'll do it. The game goes the way of the home Buckeyes. 30 to 27, students storm the field. Oof, John, game of the year has to be, right? Uh, with all the hype that was surrounding it, I agree it has to be the game of the year. Now, when you look at the game, a lot of mistakes from both sides. Did Ohio State end up winning that game, or really could you chalk it up to Michigan kind of shooting themselves in the foot too many times? Well, I mean, Michigan really had a shot to win this game uh, in regulation, but once it went to overtime, Ohio State kicks the uh, game-tying field goal. Uh, it was just gutsier play calling by Coach Urban Meyer going for it on fourth and one. A little bit of controversy with that, uh, with that spot there, but in the end, Ohio State wins it, and there's not a whole lot we can do afterwards. Absolutely. If, it, you know, if it's a boxing match, that's one you chalk up. We want a rematch of. We might get that, you know, if things shake up in the college football playoff. But those weren't the only two top-tier Big 12 teams in action, were they? Right. No, you, Michigan and Ohio State were two of the best teams in the conference this year. But let's not take away from the fact that there are two other teams in the top ten along with Michigan and Ohio State. Penn State and Wisconsin, the two teams playing in the Big Ten title game, have been absolutely outstanding this year. Wisconsin has been playing terrific defense all year long. Led by linebacker T.J. Watt, this defense has been absolutely salty, giving up around only 10 points per game, and that's led Wisconsin into the title game. Penn State, they've been the surprise of the league. They were left for dead after a 2-2 two two start, uh, losing to Pitt and Michigan. Uh, they've slowly risen through the ranks. They knocked off Ohio State by virtue of a blocked field goal, returned for a touchdown, and their running game, led by Saquon Barkley, has helped Penn State go on an eight-game winning streak. So, Eric, Penn State and Wisconsin, they're in the Big Ten title game. Ohio State's ranked number two. Now, who has a better shot of sneaking into the, uh, the playoff this year? Is it going to be the winner of the title game or Ohio State? Yeah, this is a pretty awkward situation. Ohio State's, they're feeling good. They don't, have, they don't have any more games to play, which actually might work in their favor, you know, not having this conference championship to play. Penn State, if they win this uh, conference championship over a high-ranked Wisconsin team, they have that head-to-head -head victory over Ohio State, but... They have those two losses that, and, and Ohio State, of course, only has one loss on the season. I don't think you can pull Ohio State out in place of Penn State for one of those top four positions, but if enough shakeup happens, perhaps Washington losing, Clemson losing, Penn State could be that second team into the Big 12. Michigan, hate to say it, but I think their, uh, their hopes of a championship are done this year. I definitely agree. I think Michigan's done, but you definitely could see two teams from the Big Ten sneak, sneak into the playoffs. Now let's talk some MVPs of the league. My choice for MVP this year has got to be JT Barrett. He threw for over 2,400 yards and 24 TDs. He rushed for over 800 yards and had nine TDs on the ground. He's leading arguably the best team in the Big Ten despite Penn State being in the Big Ten title game. Ohio State could be undefeated if not for special teams hampering the Buckeyes. Barrett's done everything else. He's been a leader on a great team, and he's spread the ball around, seen by the fact that eight different receivers have double-digit receptions. Yeah, definitely. As an offensive player, hard to you know, question that pick of JT Barrett. But on defense, and even just beyond the, the, re the rest of the game, it's Jabril Peppers. That man has been everywhere on the Michigan turf all season. He plays every single position on the field, or at least has played every single position, apart from the offensive and defensive line. He's been you know, one of the top Heisman candidates throughout the season. Not sure if, if you know, he's got more, more of a resume than uh, Lamar, Lamar Jackson, some of these other players. But reminiscent of great Michigan Wolverines like Desmond Howard and Charles Woodson, versatility at its finest. J, or Jabril Peppers, my pick for MVP of the Big Ten this season. You can't go wrong there, and hey, who knows? You might see him on the offensive line or defensive line in the bowl game. Absolutely. I'm kidding, he's not gonna be there. Now the Big Ten still has to sort itself out during championship weekend with two teams possibly getting to the playoffs. But how, let's move on to a conference where things are a little bit more clear. Luke Hendry and Bailey Abramovitz talk SEC football when we come back. Welcome back to College Press Box. Luke Hensry alongside Bailey Obramowitz. And this is our exclusive segment on the SEC Conference. A 2016 season that has been defined by Alabama's dominance and the LSU coaching change that recently occurred. It was definitely a great season for Alabama. They started off this year with a previous record of 14-1 and very high hopes. Head coach Nick Saban had to work the team up to their best once again to put forward a better record than before. 
They started off their season with multiple strong wins with quarterback Jalen Hurts and defensive end Jonathan Allen. Alabama has continued their season as number one overall with an impressive average winning margin of 28 points. They went 12-0 and 8-0 in the conference, one of the only two teams left with an undefeated season. Certainly has been all crimson tied in the West, but as for the East, the Florida Gators have made their way to the top. Coach Jim McElwin's program finished the season off 8-3 and 6-2 and and in conference play. Key wins for Florida came against Georgia and most recently against LSU to stamp their ticket into the SEC championship. Now turning to some of the standings, we look at the West, Alabama obviously clinching it, going 12-0, followed by Auburn, LSU, Texas A&M, Arkansas, Mississippi State, and followed up by Ole Miss. And in the East, Florida won, with, had, um, had the best record, followed by Tennessee, Georgia, Kentucky, South Carolina, and Missouri. We'd like to turn now to some MVPs that we want to award to the SEC Conference. Most importantly, on the offensive side of the ball, there is no doubt Jalen Hurts of Alabama stands out. He, yeah, he did a really great job. He, only, he had 21 touchdowns, only nine interceptions, and a QBR of 70.2. You mentioned his hard stats there, and that stands out, especially for a true freshman. But as a youth, he has shown such great leadership of controlling that offense under Nick Saban and Lane Kiffin for the Alabama Crimson Tide. And another player who showed great, great leadership this year was Miles Garrett, a defensive end from A&M. Miles Garrett, a great defensive end, as you mentioned. 32 <laughs> tackles on the season, 8.5 sacks, a leader on that side of the ball, and one of the players that stands out going into the NFL draft this coming season. We'd like to turn now to next season, even though there's a lot of 2016 left to be played, but 2017 is approaching. The reign of Alabama football seems undaunting, and their opportunity to add yet another national championship awaits. But looking ahead to next season, Bailey, how can the Alabama Crimson Tide continue their dominance and carry on this legacy into 2017? Well, for the past two years, they've had, Alabama has had a new quarterback to the team. But with the success of Jalen Hurts this year and the fact that he's staying with them next season means they have a lot more potential. They're always one of the best teams, and as long as they don't change too much in their program, I think they're going to be really successful once again. The Crimson Tide certainly sits on that college football throne, but another program that has its own history of success is LSU. The Tigers fired 10-year head coach Les Miles after the fourth game of the season this year. Coach Ed Orgeron became the interim head coach and went 5-2 and two serving in that position. As of last Saturday, however, LSU officially signed Orgeron on board as the head coach, a dream come true for Coach Orgeron. What does the hire for Ed Orgeron mean for the LSU football program? Well, uh, firing a coach in the middle of the season is always really difficult, but LSU started to show really great improvement once they had Ed Orgeron promoted to head coach of the team. He has a lot of potential, has always been a top recruiter, and all of the players really see that and seem to be really happy that he's their head coach for the next season. Certainly always an exciting year for the SEC. Alabama and Florida, as we mentioned, will compete in that SEC championship on December 3rd as both teams look to stamp their season off with a conference championship. And that's all we're going to have for the SEC exclusive segment on College Press Box. When we return, Emily Stone and Elena Vieira will discuss the all-important college football rankings. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to College Press Box. I'm Elena Vieira here with Emily Stone, and we're here to talk about the latest college football rankings and the upcoming playoffs. This week's rankings are led by Alabama, followed by Ohio State, Clemson, and Washington. Clemson is up one spot this week following a win 56-7 against South Carolina, and they have only had one loss against Pittsburgh this year. Washington's up two spots from last week, and their only loss this season is against USC. Now, Elena, what do you think of these rankings? I think they're pretty spot on. You know, Clemson has kind of had this last or late season surge, so I think they deserve this three spot, especially behind Deshaun Watson. I think they're doing pretty stellar. Yes. 
So, Emily, who do you think are going to be in the final college playoff championship game? Well, the national championship will, of course, to me, be led by Alabama. They have a 92% chance to make the playoff game according to 538, and they're Alabama, and they don't really lose. Now, joining Alabama, to me, will be the Clemson Tigers. I think that they have started with a, rock, with a bit of a rocky season, but they have come back, and they're playing really well, and I really think that they will have what it takes to take on the Crimson Tide, but I think the Crimson Tide will come away with another trophy to put in Nick Saban's case. See, I disagree. I think Alabama will be facing off against Ohio State in the final playoff game. They've got great coaching behind Urban Meyer. Their quarterback, JT Barrett, has a championship experience, and not to mention the Big Ten is the most competitive conference with, Pitt, with Penn State, Wisconsin, and all those other great teams. So I think it's pretty safe to say that Alabama's going to win it all. Oh, yeah. Alabama roll, roll tide. I think that they Are we to say feel that? like they have so much, you know, going for them. But, you know, Eleanor, what happens if, you know, Clemson and Washington lose this weekend? We know that Alabama and Ohio State are for sure lock-ins going into the playoffs. But what happens if the other two teams fall to their opponents? You know, I think there's a pretty good chance of either Michigan or the other or the Big Ten champion, champion excuse me, um, will be the four seed if Clemson or Washington happens to lose this week. Michigan's been hovering around that four spot all season, so I think that they'll probably be the front runner in that scenario. I also see Michigan coming through if one of them falls, but I can also see OU running up to the plate and, you know, really taking a step and um, being a playoff contender. But we'll just have to see what happens this weekend with Clemson and Washington. Absolutely. When we come back, we'll take a look at what's to come this week in Longhorn Sports. Don't go anywhere. After a long break for us and for you at home, we now welcome you back to College Press Box. It's our final show and final block of the year, but before we go, we wanted to reflect on this year for Texas football. Reese, with so many highs and lows, what was the best game this year? Wow, so many to choose <laughs> from. I think this Texas team surprised us a lot. Mm -hmm. Big wins stick out. On the road at Texas Tech, mm -hmm. that game against number eight at the time, Baylor, of course, mm -hmm. they lost five in a row now, but it's got to be Texas versus Notre Dame, 50-47, to 47, double OT. What a way to start the mm -hmm. season. I know you're with me on this. Absolutely. What, best game environment I've mm -hmm. ever been to and probably will ever get to go to as a student. Um, so, yeah, what a way to start that season with a win that we all thought was over a great Notre Dame mm -hmm. team. Turned out uh, they didn't even make a bowl game. Like, Texas didn't <laughs> even make a bowl game. Uh, funny how things work out. But, uh, but, anyways, I know you're with me on that. But what do you think is the best individual mm -hmm. performance by a Texas player this season? Individual, Reese, definitely have to say. Deontay Foreman has been for sure, individual performance as a whole against Texas Tech was the best. The running back exploded for 341 rushing yards. That was the third most in school history. He also had three touchdowns and averaged over 10 yards per carry. That Horns win over the Red Raiders marked his 10th straight 100-yard rushing game, which was only two games shy of Earl Campbell's record for the most con consecutive 100-yard performances. But he would later break Campbell's record against Kansas. So definitely would have to say, him against Texas State. Do you remember that run where he was running without his shoe? Yeah. That definitely sealed the deal for the best individual performance. Yeah, turns uh, out the only thing stopping his streak of 100 games is that he's probably going to leave 40 <laughs> acres, and of course Texas didn't make a bowl game, so not quite uh, enough chances to break Ricky's mm -hmm. record, of course, but did get over the 2,000 mark. Mm -hmm. uh, one can only wonder where this team would have been without Foreman, who was no question their best player. I'm going to give a quick nod to that Texas defense against Iowa State. Think back, the defense was much maligned, strong, took over the week before against Oklahoma. Eight sacks, held the Cyclones to six points at home. Really what we thought would be a turning point in the season, of course, didn't end up playing out that way, but still a good individual performance. And I'll also give it on to Michael Dixon, one of the best mm -hmm. punters in the country. Changed field position quietly, always did his job well for the Longhorns. Yes, he certainly improved from last year's little punting incident. So yeah. definitely would have to say he deserves that nod. So, Reese, you know I like to keep things positive. For sure. There's no question. I do. But the Longhorns were 5-7 and seven this year. Yes. We can't deny that. So we have to ask, what was the worst play of this year? 
Yeah, unfortunately for the Longhorns, they gave us plenty to choose from. <laughs> uh, several stick out. James Washington's mm -hmm. long touchdown against Oklahoma State and exposed Texas tackling issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jesse Ertz touchdown run on that first drive at Kansas State will, of course, signal later things to come in that mm -hmm. game. But I think it's Deonta Foreman's fumble or Shane Bouchelle's interception. You can see the fumble right here. I think that was at the point you really knew that this thing was probably done. The strong era was most likely over. That was really the low point of the entire season for me. Absolutely. I think back to watching that game, and it was so crazy how, you know, fumble by Foreman twice. Yeah. So many. Six uh, turnovers. Six turnovers, and definitely was the thing that sealed uh, the fate for Strong. But, Reese, there definitely was explosive offense and defense, for sure. Uh, but what one play sticks out to you as the best play of the year? Because I have mine, and it is Swoop's touchdown to beat Notre Dame. Yeah, I think there's several to choose from, but no question that's the best play the mm -hmm. whole year. The broadcast call at the time of Texas is back, folks, was mm -hmm. so fitting. At least it seemed like, but the effort for that guy, uh, of course, turns out Texas wasn't back at all. But that is a play I'll never forget. I know Swoops will never forget it. DK, DKR went nuts, and for one of the most criticized players in the Longhorn program mm -hmm. over the last four years, pretty awesome to see the 18-wheeler roll into the end zone and beat, and really what is the biggest win for Texas mm -hmm. in the last several years. Absolutely. I, like you said, that game environment was unreal. And absolutely, at the time, we thought that was Texas being back. And, you know, at the time, we think about how, uh, what a big game that was, and the stakes were so high. And even though it sort of, you know, teased us a little bit, <laughs> yeah. uh, it definitely was a special. But that's all we have to do it for our final show of the semester. We'll see you in the spring when Texas basketball takes over and baseball begins. Absolutely. Make sure to keep up with us on social media at TSTV Sports. Our show airs every Monday night at 930, but don't forget about Wednesdays at 9 when we dive into some sports debate on College Crossfire. And folks, that is the host right here, Reese Miller of College Crossfire. We want to thank everyone who's taking part in making this show possible in this semester. And a special thanks to all of you who have supported us and tuned in throughout the year. Until next time, he's Reese Miller. I'm Katarina Bean-Cardi. We wish you a safe Christmas break and good night.